Glad that you're here this morning as we're... Uh, I want to take a moment to remind you about our marriage retreat that's coming up. If you have not signed up, it's real important that you get it taken care of today. Come Monday or Tuesday, whatever it is, we have to release uh, a bunch of those rooms back to the condo place, the Casa Del Mar in Galveston. So we're trying to get those taken care of now. So be sure and get uh, signed up if you haven't taken the time to get it done. There are, as you leave today, you'll look out on the left in the lobby. There's a whole little section over there that says marriage conference there, get signed up, taking care of that, because it's going to be an incredible, incredible time. Every year we do this, it just keeps getting better and better and better. So uh, take note of it, get signed up for it, don't put it off any longer, now's the time to do it. You say, well, I didn't bring my checkbook or whatever. You can do it online, you just go to bfchurch.com, follow the links for the One Flesh Conference, and uh, you can sign up for it there. But it's going to be fun, it's always a great time of the Lord, it's always great fellowship, uh, give the couples lots of free time, take care of things they want to go and watch, do, or see in Galveston, so... Uh, uh, come be a part of it. I want to uh, drop right in the middle of a sermon series today that we've been, we're doing on Wednesday nights here at the Spring Campus. Starting next month, I'll start this series at the Magnolia Campus. But this series is on uh, reconnecting with God. And it deals with the whole aspect of us having a, a real revival in our hearts and lives and our church and, and, and ultimately the prayers in our nation. I really do believe that uh, we're kind of aboard the Titanic and it's getting ready to hit a iceberg if it hadn't hit it already. That things are really desperate in our nation. And even though I vote a certain way and as conservative as you can get, uh, I do not believe that the Republicans nor the Democrats nor the Libertarians or any political party is the answer for the situation that we face in our nation and our country. I do believe we have an obligation to vote as biblically, righteously as possible to find a candidate who's closest to our biblical convictions and stand for those candidates and promote them and encourage them and do what we can to see that they get elected. Because uh, righteousness, the Bible tells us, is the key to the success of any nation. The Bible tells us sin is a reproach to every nation. So we don't want to be a nation that continues this headlong sliding course into oblivion because we ignore God. God's the answer. Jesus is Lord, all right? And uh, that's the course we have to take. So I'll be saying more about that as we get closer to the elections. And yes, I probably will stand up and endorse a candidate. Be sure and tell the IRS. Amen. Because uh, there, that law that was passed by uh, under the... Uh, administration of previous presidents back in the 60s, whenever it was, is completely unconstitutional, which declares separation of church and state, which basically says any 501c3 corporation cannot endorse a political candidate or a party. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's basically, if you're a Christian or a pastor, you don't have freedom of speech. Amen. The church should never be infringed upon by the government to exercise its free and, and, and civil liberties that we've granted under our Constitution. You can't say, shut up if you're a Christian. You can't say shut up if you're a pastor. Now that law came into being under the, the, the senatorship of a Texas senator named Lyndon Baines Johnson who was ticked off because he almost lost the election that year. Lyndon Baines Johnson went to the Senate and passed this law through and it became a law which says that pastors or churches, it basically doesn't say church, it just says 501c3s cannot endorse a political candidate. Now he was ticked off himself because he almost lost that election because there were two Christian businessmen who formed a nonprofit organization to have political interest. And so he was all mad about it. The church wasn't the intended target even to begin with. It was I think T.D. Hunt and some other conservative Christian businessmen that Johnson was mad at because he almost lost his, his run. And so to get back at them, he went to Washington. The first thing he did was try to press through this particular legislation that silenced 501c3s. Uh, it affected immediately churches. And I want you to know, as I have always done, I, I have this simple philosophy of ministry when it comes to preaching that Peter and John had when they went, had to go before the Sanhedrin. And that simple, simple word was this, shall we obey God or man? When it comes to the nation and it comes to the church, we always are going to exalt righteousness and we're always going to exalt Jesus Christ as the Lord over all things. Amen? Amen. So... If that disturbs you, then you have been duped by a, a particular legislation that is not even constitutional at its core. So uh, you say, well, what are you going to do if they come after you? I'm going to praise the Lord because we can finally get it for the Supreme Court. Amen. 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 No, you're not going to have to pay for it, all right? 
All right, let's get my sound set and quit messing with it, all right? Just give me something to work with, all right? Uh, nothing more distracting. All right, so uh, uh, by the way, I, I'm part of a group that, of pastors that if there is any retro from the IRS or their parties, we have a core of 1,100 lawyers who are standing ready to get this thing before the Supreme Court and are hoping that somebody gets in trouble for it. <laughs> you know, there's other times we can talk about some other things that have happened in history, like the Black Robe Militia. These were pastors all over the American colonies who stood up and promoted the revolution against England uh, for their unjust behavior and the taxation. These were pastors who were at the core of what even happened in the establishment of our nation. So we don't need to be silent ever. Amen? But I think what has to happen is we're going to have to get connected back up to God and have revival in our spiritual life. And this is what I've been talking about on Wednesday night, and we'll continue to talk about next Sunday and this last Wednesday night. Now, we've had real good crowds until this last Wednesday night. Some of y'all backslid on me because you knew, I think, what I was going to talk about, which is revival. And one of the things I've asked people to do at the very beginning of this series was to pray something like this. God, help me not to be afraid of you moving in my life. Help me not to be afraid of revival happening. Because there's a lot of people, and Christians, I really believe, who know they need to get right with God, but they're afraid. What's God going to do? What's going to happen? What's going to require of them? Listen, Jesus said that I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. That's a good deal, all right? So you don't have to be afraid. Anything's better than where you're at right now. Amen. So revival is a key, and it's an essential key in our nation, in our churches, in our pastors, as well as the people who sit in the pews Sunday after Sunday. We need God to move and to do something. Now, I explained what revival was in a, in a very simple definition on Wednesday nights when I said revival is the extraordinary movement of the Spirit of God in the heart of God's people that produces extraordinary results. In other words, God starts moving, incredible things begin to happen. Now, it starts first and foremost with the core of, of, of God's people. That word revive uh, is from a Latin terminology of the word vive, even in Spanish, for life. You know, this, that, that, and what happens is we are alive in Christ, but some of us have grown cold, and some are getting stagnant in their walk with God and distant in their walk with God, and they need a revive, all right? So revival is for those who've been vived to start with. You have to experience life. If you don't know Jesus, you have yet to come to life. You're just kind of a hunk of warm meat walking around. You need Christ in your life. You need to give your heart and your life to Jesus so he can, you can begin to understand what life is really, really all about and what God's plan and purpose is for your life. But in the church today, what we need is a revival and a reworking among believers, you know. And revival really describes those seasons, really, that when God does something very unique, He's restored to his rightful place in our hearts and our lives, and he does something unique in the midst of his people, in the, in the midst of churches, in the midst of families and individuals. God starts doing something just radically beautiful in hearts and lives. Now, we've seen these kind of awakenings and these re kind of revivals throughout history. In fact, during the 1770s and the, the, the season of revival in Virginia, they said that God moved so much in that season and that year that the Methodist church gained about 1,400% in its, in, its, uh, in its attendance. Now, the population rate in America was about 200% increasing that year because a lot of people were coming and, you know, wanting to be a part of this. But that was 200%. Their growth rate was 1,400%. God was doing supernatural things. Even the Baptists in Virginia were seeing great moves of God. They said every night meetings would last five to six hours and sometimes all the way through the night as people just wanted to get in the, the, around other believers. They wanted to be under the Word of God. They wanted to bring their friends to the Word of God. They said in three summer months of 1770, in three counties that were recorded in the Baptist churches, 1,600 decisions in one county, 1,800 conversions in another county, 800 conversions in another county. A total of 3,200 conversions in three small counties in just three months. That's phenomenal. That's, that can only be described as one thing. God was doing something extraordinary in the hearts and the lives of people. But you follow the awakenings through history and you see this during what they called the Prayer Revival of 1858. In two years' time, in the States, one million people were converted to Christ. In two years. One million people. While the population of the United States was about 30 million people at that time, if we were to see the equivalent ratio of that take place today, our present population is over 300 million, we'd see close to 10 million people converted in just two years' time. Isn't that phenomenal? But then you, don't you want to be a part of something like that? Isn't there something you say, man, I'd love to see God move like that in our nation and restore the greatness of, of God in the midst of the people of God? Uh, that's my heart. 
I want to live long enough to see that day. The closest thing I've ever seen to it, some of you that are younger haven't seen that. Even in the 70s, there was a stirring across this nation with the Jesus movement. A lot of people coming to Christ, thousands and thousands of people coming to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And certainly what an epic time, but we need another epic time. Because if we do not see another epic timing, uh, I tell you, we're in trouble. That's the bottom line, we're in trouble. So what do we need? We need revival to take place. Now, I, I think that there are things that we can do. I mean, revival is always a sovereign move of God, when and where He decides to. But God does invite us to pray for that. If my people which are called by my name, it says in 2 Chronicles, remember. If my people fast, if they'll pray, if they'll seek my faith, if they'll turn from their, their wicked ways. And God says, I'll, I'll restore them, I'll move on them, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do a great work. God wants to do a great work in hearts today. Now, on Wednesday nights, I've been talking about the process, you know, of how God works in the hearts of his children, how God works in the heart of the people of God, and what he does and how it works. Now, last Wednesday night, we spoke about this, and this is why I think some people didn't want to come, <laughs> this issue of humility. Uh, most of us, you know, tell each other that we're humble. In fact, you, you, know, I, I, you like to read my book on how I obtained humility. But... The truth of the matter is, there's not a lot of folks who walk with this kind of humility in their life. The humility that God says, I'll give greater grace to those who are humble. In Isaiah 57, it says, God says, I, I dwell in the high and lofty place, and I dwell there with those who have a contrite and a broken heart. In other words, if we really get humble before God and let, realize that God is God and not us, that His rightful place is at the very core of our being, that He deserves to be God because He is God. And his rightful place should be at the head of all things, including our very lives. He should be controlling and the head of that. But these preparation steps are important. I believe the first preparation step is humility, but after that comes honesty. Now, we're not living in a culture that's real honest anymore. Everybody seems to lie. Amen? You say, except me. There you're starting right off. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, just look, sometimes it's these big, carefully, you know, manufactured, fabricated lies. Sometimes it's those what we call the little white lies, but all lies are lies, folks. Sometimes we don't say anything, it's just our silence. And with our silence, we hide the truth. Sometimes it's by our actions, the very way that we're pretending to give a better impression of ourselves, perhaps, than, than it's really true. We just don't really know what's going on in the hearts and the lives of people, really. It's kind of like the, the old couple, you know, they were celebrating their 50th. And they'd been married these long years, and family had gathered, friends were around, and, you know, Pop gets up, he's been married to his precious little bride for 50 years, and he wants to, to, to celebrate and toast his wife, and he, he stands up and he says something like this. After 50 years of marriage, he turns to his wife, I have found you to be tried and true. To which she responds, huh? After 50, you get that way, right? And he says it a little louder. After 50 years, I have found you to be tried and true. She said, well, let me tell you something, buddy. After 50 years, I'm tired of you too. Fifty long years of deception. <laughs> but people lie. We lie, we lie. You know, people lie at work on their expense accounts, or they want to give a better impression to, to those who work with, or maybe the boss of, of something that's not true. Maybe they're just not really diligent, but they're, they're going to put on a big pretense of diligent whenever the supervisor comes by. Sometimes it's at home, not being honest with friends and family, or spouse, or, or parents, or children. Not being truthful with them. Sometimes it's at recreation. We tell everybody we're a lot better than what our abilities are. I love to play golf with the guys from Believer's Fellowship. None of them are worth anything. <laughs> but yet they'll lie to you. They'll tell you how good they are. I was playing with Doug, Wood, uh, uh, Doug Nolan one day. <laughs> Doug, Doug this, this ball goes off into oblivion. I don't know what happened to it. I think it was scared to show itself again, wasn't it, Doug? <laughs> he said something like this. I can't believe I hit that. I said, I can. I watched your last eight holes. <laughs> Wasn't any problem at all, was it, Doug? <laughs> uh, we just want to you know, be better and look better and sound better. I mean, at school, students to teachers, teachers to students sometimes, friends, classmates, the whole idea. You know, it's this deception. And people are so accustomed to deception. And that then they get to this place where the greatest deception they experience is just not being honest before God. 
When God speaks to our heart, we just, you know, we, we choose to, our deception. We, we often seek just to cover our sins, you know, kind of hide things. So, you know, so we can feel like we're in a better condition spiritually than we really are. We don't want to be exposed to too much truth or too much preaching because it might just expose us to where our life really is and how we really do need God, but we're not embracing God and we're not following God. Deception. And what greater deception is there when we come to, to this in regard to the spiritual walk and the spiritual life with God? You've heard me say before, I think we need to go through, if we're going to sing the old hymns, we, we, should, re, we should go through the hymn book for the modern church today and retitle some of the hymns. Let me give you a few illustrations of what I talk about. Wherever he leads me, I'll consider following. That's my favorite. Or, oh, how I like Jesus. Fill my spoon, Lord. I'll do one of these things, you know, where they do the, the record th the specials, you know. And songs by so-and-so. Great songs like, it is my secret, what God can do. And then we got some others. I just got to share them with you. What an acquaintance we have in Jesus. And then, blessed be the tie that doesn't cramp my style. Pillow of ages, fluff for me. I surrender some. On this, and don't miss, I am fairly certain that my Redeemer lives. Then the Baptist theme song, sit up, sit up for Jesus. Take my life and let me be. And the all-time favorite of I love to talk about telling the story. Isn't that a classic? <laughs> What's happened? We sing these songs, but in their deception, if we would sing the songs the proper way and still not be true in our hearts, as much as it is to, to, to say we, we believe the Bible and not really be believing the Word of God by our obedience in our life. And I, I think that if we're going to experience the kind of revival and the kind of awakening that God wants us to experience, say not even on the national, but even on a personal level, then we're going to have to begin by getting honest with God and letting God expose us to us to show us where our needs are, to show us what we're really like, not what we would tend to, to make people believe that we're like. Some type of wellspring of honesty is going to have to break forth before the river of redemptive results begins to flow in our hearts and lives. I want to look at today at, in, in Psalms 32. If you have your Bible, you can open it there. We'll look at verses 1 through 6. But here's a man who chose now at Psalms 32 to be honest with God and chose at this point in Psalms 32, you'll see him, Choosing to get right with God. This is a psalm that's around the history of David and Bathsheba. And David's finally getting honest with God about his relationship and about his morality. And he's coming clean with God. And you see here in the stories he confesses to God. And God gets, he gets the place of being right. He comes clean. And then he, he follows through with the, the great blessings of God and what God does in the life of someone who comes clean. And by the way, lest somehow it slipped in your heart and mind, these are not fairy tales. This is real stuff. These were real people living in real times with real problems and real issues, and David was a real guy who messed up royally. I mean, big time messed up. He committed adultery with another man's wife, then he sought to have the man killed, completing a murder, then continued to try to deceive the country, the nation, God, and himself, and everybody else. No telling how long this goes on. I'm not sure. And there's different debates about theologians how, how long this period goes on between his deception and his getting right with God. But in Psalms 32, it's one of those classic psalms like Psalms 51 where he's explaining his, his heart broken before God. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile or no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin... My body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Say a lot. Think about that. I acknowledge my sin to you, God, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you will forgive the guilt of my sin. Say a lot. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. What's David saying here? I got right with God. Bottom line, I got right with God. I was not right with God, and I got right with God. And then he begins to lay out the results, what God does in the heart of somebody who's willing to get right with God. He talks about in me getting honest, Here's what happened in my life. The result of my honesty before God brought these things. God did these things in my life. So let me give you about four or five of these things. First of all, what honesty will do. Honesty brings the blessing 
of full forgiveness he talks about in verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. There's nothing greater than walking around free. There's nothing more energetic and more exciting in your spiritual life than when you give your life completely over to Christ. You will experience a new found freedom. It happened in 1973. I know some of you weren't even a thought in your father's eyes yet, all right? But in 1973, I gave my life to Christ. All right? I was a wreck. I had made a mess of my life in every way possible. And I finally got sick and tired of living that way. I asked God to forgive me and to come into my life. If what he said in this book was true, that's what I wanted. And you know what? He forgave my sins. This is what he said. David said, I went to God and I am forgiven. And the word here in this context has, is a word which means it was carried away. I'm carrying it. I'm carrying this burden. I'm holding it. God took the load. He took it from me. And then he said, and then he covered my sins. And this is a word in the Hebrew language means to completely conceal something. It cannot be found. It will not be found. It will never be discovered again. It's done. It's over. He said, I, God has, did this for me. He completely dealt with this. And then he says, blessed is the man whose sins are not imputed to his account or to his life. That's an accounting term, which means to put something out there or to lay something to someone's charge. In other words, if you're found guilty of something, there's a charge brought against you judicially, legally, you're found guilty. Now you have to bear the sentence for what you've done. He's saying, listen, the Lord did not impute my guilt to me. He forgave me. He removed it. He covered it. And as I got honest with God, I received forgiveness, and my sins are no longer on the ledger. They're not in the accounting. They're taken care of. Where'd they go? They were paid for. Who paid for them? Where did he pay for them? I couldn't hear that. On the cross. He took all our sins. You say, oh, man, he can't take all my sins. He took all your sins. But you don't know what I've done. He took all your sins. And this always amazes me. We get this idea, well, you know, you just don't know what I've done. I'm sure you're a scoundrel. I mean, you're probably pretty rotten, all right? And I, I, you say, you'd be surprised. I doubt it. Why? Because I know most of you. And most of all, I know what I came out of. God's a big God, not a little God. God forgives big sins. His big son died on the big cross and paid the big price. All our sins, covered, forgiven, taken away because of the blood of Jesus Christ. What a blessing there is for full forgiveness. Where does that start? It starts with honesty. Listen to what C.H. Spurden said, the great speaker said, a liar is not a forgiven soul. There can be no blessedness to tricksters with their plans pretending. They are too much afraid of discovery to be at ease. Their house is built on the volcano's brink. Now, how much true is that than realizing what a volcano is, the fiery brim? In other words, you can't, you can't lie to God. You might be able to lie to everybody else, but you can't lie to God, all right? And David is saying, hey, I confess my sins. I got honest, and now I've experienced this. But what happens? If I don't confess my sins, then it's just continued pain, heartache. In fact, he says, not only does it bring this forgiveness, he said, honesty brings the blessing of decreased deceit in my life. What happens when we sin against God? We open the door for deception. Now, you've heard me say it a thousand times. I'm going to say it a thousand times more before I quit. Amen? One day when I die. It's this. The problem with being deceived is this. You don't know you're being deceived. That's why they call it deception. <laughs> All right? And what's he saying? He says, you know, you can deceive yourself. The Bible says we should be careful lest any of us should be deceived through the deceitfulness of sin. And so what happens when we choose against God, we choose our will, we walk into deception. We think we're all right. We've told ourselves we're all right. Everything's cool. I'm cool. You're cool. Everybody's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. And David's getting to the honest point now. He said, I've been living in this deceit, and I'm sick and tired of this deceit. You know, I'm, I'm willing now to deal with my sin and be honest with God and be open with God because that's where freedom is. If I do not, what happens? Here's the tragedy. Deceit opens the door for more deceit. How many, how many times you looked at somebody's life and said, ah, man, they know better. How can they be doing that? Peter warned in, 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 the, in his letter to the church. He said, listen, he said, you need to be careful. Be, be sure to add to your faith you know, virtue. And he went through this list of things to add to your faith. He says, because there are those who haven't, and you know, now they're blind, and they've forgotten what manner of person they really were. 
The Bible tells us, Jesus said in Matthew, in the last days, there's going to be so much sin abounding that the love of many people will wax cold. It's possible to get cold and not know it because we're deceived by our sin. Now, what happens if I choose to stay there, I just become more deceived and more deceived. And so this is what he's saying is, listen, I, I wanted to confess my sin, and I confess my sin. Until that point, he's living deception. He deceived himself. And not only did he see himself by saying, well, it's okay for me to have this relationship, or I had this relationship, it's all right. Then he starts to cover up, and, you know, and has to deal with Uriah, and lies to him, ultimately leading to his murder. Then he lies to Bathsheba, he lies to God, he lies to the people, he pretended to be the righteous king. When he wasn't righteous, he just put on a show, and he deceived God, or at least he tried to deceive God, because, you know, you never hide anything from him. The Bible says, even the darkness is light to him. And he's saying here, listen, I... I'm not living in deceit anymore. I got honest. The third thing is honesty brings the blessing of removed conviction. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, sometimes, you know, we don't understand conviction. First of all, conviction's a blessing when you respond to it. The Holy Spirit has been given unto us. The Bible says, Jesus said when he comes, he'll reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's kind of a threefold ministry. But the first step, the first work of the Holy Spirit in every person's life is to convict you about your sin to reprove you, to show you where you're wrong. Why? So I can feel bad? No. So you can get right with God. So you can enter life. If it were not for this work of the Holy Spirit, we'd never be saved. And if it were not for this continuing work of the Holy Spirit, we'd never grow in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit comes to teach and to instruct, but also to convict us of our sin. Now, when I confess, that's where it should lead to, I confess my sin and God forgives me and I experience this grace. But if I do not confess, then you kind of see in the psalm where David is talking about all the problems that he had. He talked about physical deterioration. He said, my body wasted away. My vitality was drained as with, the, as with the fever heat of summer. You know what that means? How many of you are out working in your, your yard this August? In the middle of summer, pushing a lawnmower, and you just got to the point, you say, oh, man, i got to get inside. I'm going to kill myself here. You know, your heart's beating. You're starting to get weak. You know, you need something to drink. You're starting to dehydrate. And you start, you're getting fuzzy. Maybe you worked out in the summer, you know, maybe out in the outdoors in construction or something. You know exactly what I'm talking about. He said, this is, my conviction was getting me to that point. You know, I had the shakes, I'm miserable, I'm empty inside, there's something lacking, I know I'm in trouble. This is just a physical thing we go through when we keep resisting God. God made us that way so that we'll respond to conviction. And it's not going to go away until you get right with God. It's not going to get any better. Don't think you can just keep going the way you're going and things are going to somehow turn out better. It's not physical deterioration. Then he talked about an emotional deterioration. He said, I groaned all the day long. There's no joy in my life. In fact, this thing called guilt, it's in our heart. God, God gave us the capacity for that so we would understand that he's moving and he's working in us and wanting to do something in us. And when the guilt is there and it's pervasive and it's reaching into the parts of our life to show us we're not right with God, you know, then all kinds of things get out of whack. Depression, anxiety, negativity, anger, extreme sensitivity, everything around us, undue strong reactions, even panic attacks. Now, not all sin is results in those kind of things, but it, because, you know, some, some of those things can result just because God may be taking you through some journey in your life at some place where you're having to learn how to grow up. But if sin is unchecked, then certainly you open the door for all kinds of physical problems and emotional problems and ultimately spiritual problems. David said, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Have you ever had God's hand pressing on you? Day and night. This heaviness was in my life. This, this pressure, you know, that the Lord puts on a human heart from conviction should weigh heavy upon you. God's trying to get you to the place to listen to Him and to hear Him and to respond to Him, to agree with Him, to repent and come to life. I love it. Quote Spurgeon again. When I talk about revival, I can't help but quote C.H. Spurgeon. He said, you know, God's hand is very helpful when it uplifts but it is awful when it presses down. It says, better a world on the shoulder like Atlas. Y'all have seen the statue of Atlas with a world on the shoulder. Better a world on the shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on the heart like David. He said, this is the way it was for me. Honesty got me out of that. The last point of this is honesty brings blessing, the blessing of intimate counsel and leadership by God himself. And this is where David says, listen, when I got right with God, it made me what God began to lead me and instruct me and to guide me. I began to enjoy what God intended for mankind in the beginning, to walk with him and to know him and to hear his voice and to know you're hearing from him. If you read through Psalms 32, the rest of verse 8 says, the Lord says, I will instruct you 
and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Verse 9 says, do not be like the horse and the mule. Stupid. Well, that's a Jorm's translation. They have no understanding. Whose trappings include a bit and a bridle to hold them in check. That can't be comfortable for the mule or the horse. You have to have a bridle stuck in your mouth the whole time to be led by back and forth like that. God said, don't be like that. Don't be the kind of person I have to push and pull and, and move and manipulate in your life to get you somewhere. Get to the point where you can walk with me and hear me and enjoy the relationship we have. God prefers us to respond, not just to, to some kind of outward difficulty going in our life and say, so i got to get to God, but God prefers us to respond to his gentle promptings, to his leading, to his gentle leading of the Spirit of God in our life. And, you know, have you ever watched Disobedient Children? Some of you might have disobedient children this morning. What David says, you know, the, the Lord led me with his eyes. What's the last thing a disobedient child wants to do? Look at you. Parents, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you use this little saying right here? Look at me when I'm talking to you. I'm over here. Look, look, I'm talking to you. Look at me when I talk to you. You've said that before. Actually, some of you might have said it this morning. Why? Because you want to make sure they hear what you're saying. But the child doesn't want to look at you. Why didn't he want to look at you? He knows he's wrong. She knows she hadn't done right. She wants to look anywhere but up and at you. That's the last place I want to look. That's the way it is with God's children sometimes. Guilt just makes us look everywhere else but to whom we're accountable to. And I want you to know we are accountable to God. And here's the beauty of this. God says, you know, I just want to be able to direct you with my eyes. To look at something. You, you know what I'm talking about. My wife can, can, can look at me like that. I know what she's talking about. You know, we've been together a long time. So there's some things we don't have to say. We can just look. Amen. Sometimes it's a good look. Sometimes it's not a real good look. Yeah. I try to tell her, that look doesn't look good on you. <laughs> She's not going to feel good either. She. <laughs> we know what that looks like. But God says, I want to be able to just, so that you respond to my look. So when I look in a way, you, yeah, that, you, you know what we're talking about. You know what I mean. Isn't that the way that it should be in our relationship with the Lord? In other words, I believe that God really does long to counsel and to guide us. But it only happens with people who are willing and humble and honest and open with God. And they can, they can be counseled simply by God's eye being upon them and God speaking to them. So the question, obviously, should be at this point, and go ahead, is this. How, you know, how do we go about getting honest with God? Well, it's like this. Honesty is developed by full acknowledgement and confession. If you read verse, I believe it's verse 5 of that chapter, Psalm 32, David uses the personal pronoun, me, my, I, about eight times. He just goes through this, and he just, he just, he's bringing all the attention back to himself. He's saying, I was wrong, I did this, I was wrong, I did this. And he's, just, he's confessing his failure, he's confessing his dishonesty, and he's fully acknowledging that he's responsible. He's not blaming his wife, he's not blaming Bathsheba, he's not blaming Uriah, he's not blaming the people, he's not blaming the stress from the job. He's just getting honest. And that transaction of honesty, that's, that's where God moves in, where I confess I don't have to go out here and prove myself. I don't have to go out here and do X number of deeds before God, God forgives me. No, when I confess my sin before God, I'm forgiven because the price has already been paid. 1 John 1, 9, God promises forgiveness if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. I mean, that's an anthem verse. Most Christians know it by heart, but not most Christians are walking in it. Have you ever really asked God to give you a real clear picture of what you're like? I'm going to close this with a, with a two-page quote up here on the wall. It's, this is Arthur Pink. Didn't preach a lot of sermons. Author spent most of his life writing. And he's expressing his, his passion for honesty with God and holiness and prayer. He preached like, search me, O God. Reveal to me myself. If I am deceived, undeceive me, ere I be eternally too late. Enable me to measure myself faithfully by thy word so that I may discover whether or not my heart's been renewed, whether I've abandoned every course of self-will and truly surrendered to thee, whether I have so repented that I hate all sin and I fervently long to be free from its power. Loathe myself, he says, I, to loathe myself and seek diligently to deny myself whether my faith is that which overcomes the world or whether it be only a mere notional thing which produces no godly living. Whether I'm a fruitful branch of the vine or only a cumberer of the ground. In short, 
whether I be a new creature in Christ or only a painted hypocrite. If I have an honest heart, then I am willing, yea, anxious to face and know the real truth about myself. This is a prayer to reconnect. This is a prayer of humility. This is a prayer, I think, that's similar to what David the psalmist prayed when he said, Lord, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. In other words, God, I don't want to deceive myself. It's possible. And I don't want to be deceived by sin. That's possible. I want to really walk with you. I don't want to play church. 1973, I grew up in a very Christian home. My mama was a very strong person for the Lord. But I didn't want anything to do with it. I want to do what I want to do. About the age of 16 and 17, I've been praying something like this. God, I don't, not, I don't deny that you're there. I just don't want you here. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I don't now you're God, but you're just, I, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm surprised that God didn't take us up and go, <laughs> <laughs> He could have. But in mercy and grace, he didn't. Several years went by of me just making a wreck. Five years from that point. Just wrecking everything. Everything I thought I was doing right was wrong. Even the good things I tried to do fell apart. Every relationship fell apart. Every situation fell apart. In hindsight, I saw now all the people that were praying for me, so praise God, it kept falling apart. As the mercy of God, it could well be that things have been going that way in your life because his conviction can't run from it. But I remember the night I finally gave my life to Christ. I just prayed a simple prayer. As I said a while ago, Lord, what you say in this is true. This is what I want. But I added these words. I just don't want to play church. I cannot tell you how many hundreds, maybe thousands of times, the Lord has reminded me, echoed that prayer in my heart and mind over the years. You're playing church. Don't play, you said you won't play church. You're playing church. You've got to have to wake me up, stir my heart again, get back to reality. It's not pretending. It's, not play, it's just being alive. It's just enjoying God, enjoying life, enjoying the fullness of life. I know one thing, if I had continued in the course I was going, that's not where I was headed. And I had to ask God to forgive me for making a wreck out of everything. And praise God, he did. He forgave me. I have some big stuff, some of you might say. But all sin is sin. It's all unbelief. We don't go to hell for what we do. We go to hell for what we are. And without God, we're nothing. Without God, we're lost. And without God, we're left to ourselves. No hope. If you've never given your life to Christ, you need not to reconnect. You need to connect. You need to give your heart completely, and you need to be honest. You don't need to make any excuses. You got to, I'm just, I haven't really done this. I need to get right with you. I don't want to play church either. If you're here as a Christian, and God's been stirring in your heart, and I have been praying for us all that God would stir this in our hearts, and arouse us to a new appetite with a new hunger for him to go deeper. If you're a Christian, you're just a step away. Humility, honesty, that's where it starts. Of course, Wednesday night I'll talk about repentance on a little more level, so be here. But there's that element where you come to God and we just throw it all before him and say, you're God, I'm not. You be God in my life. What would you do today? If you had the opportunity to give your life completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, what would you do? One or two things. You'll walk out here and say, I'm not interested. Or you'll say, I'm, I'm not passing this moment up. What would you do today as a Christian if you had the opportunity to, right now to start fresh, start with revival, to start with a new hunger, a new passion, to be honest with God and say, God, the things in my life show me that are, that, are, that are destructive. Would you do anything about that? Well, bless God, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to do something and to make a decision. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Fathers, we come right now to this place and our hearts are sensitive and open to what you would say and do. May our adversary not be able to deceive us at any point in this journey. May your Holy Spirit be allowed free reign in our hearts and life. May be willing to, to, to come to you without fear in our hearts to say, Lord, show me what's in my life. Show me where I need to get right. Show me what I need to do. God, may you guide this time and this moment right now. And may you be glorified in it. 
I trust, God, for you to move in a great way in our hearts and lives. With every head bowed just for a moment, I just want you right there where you are just to do business with the Lord. Maybe something he spoke to you about. Maybe this area of honesty in some regard in your life. Maybe you've been pushing something aside. It's time to come clean with God. See what he will do in your life.